Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Program Manager, Autodesk Sustainability, and our host, Sarah Crazley. Hello, everybody. No response? Hello, everybody. That's better. That's better. So I'm Sarah Crazley. I uh, am a program manager for Autodesk Sustainability Initiative, particularly manufacturing. And I spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about the future. So I think about a design decision that an engineer makes today and how that will impact resources in the future, like water or energy. I also do some blogging for Fast Company, and I, I look at uh, the role of an entrepreneur uh, inside a large organization like myself at Autodesk. I think what really fascinates me is how a small idea that gets generated by an individual or a small group of people grows inside a company and allows that company to stretch to the future. That's what really excites me, and that's why I've been appointed as your humble cruise director. Now, it would be very boring if I stood up here and talked to you about what I think the future of making stuff is going to be like. So I've invited some experts along with me. The first expert I brought along with me is Felix. Felix is my nephew. Felix is eight, so he's a little younger than Skylar, who we met this morning. This was his Halloween costume. He decided that he didn't want to be Obama or Romney, he wanted to be the election. The little uh, lights that you see at the top of his ballot box, those he wired with his father. He speaks Chinese, he speaks Spanish fluently, he plays the piano and the drums much better than I do. Now, of course, I think Felix is absolutely exceptional, uh, but when we think about it and from what we heard from Skylar this morning, there are hundreds of thousands of Felix's all over the world. This is the future of the workforce, folks. Now, Felix recently started his first business. I think we can all think back to lemonade stands or you know, mowing lawns or whatever you did at an age around Felix's. And, and Felix decided to make a coffee company. So this is Felix's good old coffee. And what Felix decided to do was put a little coffee stand under the freeway in Oakland, California, where he lives. And he would offer shots of coffee, just a dollar, you know, just enough to get you uh, warmed up and caffeinated while you're waiting for a casual carpool. And I was on the phone with his mother a few weeks ago, and I was like, well, how's business? And she said, it's not great. And I said, well, why? And she said, well, it turns out that people in the Bay Area drink tea much more than coffee. So I said, well, how'd you find that out? And she said, well, Felix went up to people waiting in line and he said, hey, why aren't you buying coffee or what could we offer you uh, that would be more of a benefit than what we're delivering right now? Now, I highly doubt anybody in the audience here is a direct competitor of Felix's good old coffee. So why am I imparting this wisdom to you? The reason I'm imparting it is because Felix at eight years old knows instinctually that you have to bring customers in to the development process early. He just knows that. That's just common sense. That's not something you hire innovation consultants to do. That's just something you do. And again, this is the future workforce. We will be working alongside Felix in about 12 years. So I've, I've welcomed some other experts to the stage today who are a little bit older and more seasoned than Felix, and they're gonna talk about themes of what we all agree are going to be the future trends of business and design. You're gonna hear trends about uh, businesses coming to market faster. You're gonna hear about connectivity, not only in the sort of attributes of the product itself, but the groups that develop a product. And you're also gonna hear about open platforms. So the old paradigm of taking your IP and gripping onto it for dear life is not gonna be the way business is done in the future. So you're gonna hear about all of those things. Now what I would love for you to do in the time that we have together is to just be here. If you can put away your iPads, your iPhones, and all of that stuff, and like, let's just be here together and get excited, because I think you're gonna be really excited by the folks we've assembled together for you today. So are you ready for the first one? Okay, 
Well, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Jay Rogers, the CEO of Local Motors. Jay? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to make our friend here on the boom follow me around as much as possible. So thank you for letting me be here today. I am humbled to talk to this great assembled crowd about the future of vehicle innovation. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Local Motors, and I am on the year five of a 100-year odyssey to change the pace of automotive. So here we go in five minutes. This is the first crowd-created car. It's called the Rally Fighter. And if you want to see one, it's downstairs in Exhibit Hall 3. And I drove it here from Phoenix yesterday. And I personally have put over half a million miles on rally fighters out there. And there are 55 of them out on the road. I encourage you to come down. And for some lucky visitors, I'll be giving rides tomorrow when I take it out of the hall. We are a vehicle innovation community. We're a company that formed a community. We're both virtual and physical. There are 30,000 of us around the world, and we have micro factories that make the dreams of these people become real. The Rally Fighter was built in such a micro factory. There are three revenue streams that sustain our business. I think they'll change over time. In fact, I have no doubt that they'll change over time. But for now, we make tools, or we provide tools that are made. We make them available. We make services available to large companies who need innovation from the likes of our design, engineer, fabricator, enthusiast type community. And we sell products, usually made by members of our community, to people who are willing buyers of the most innovative automotive products that are out there. That's how we make money. Everybody who runs a business has to figure out what it's going to cost and how much they're going to get people to pay for it in order to be able to stick around. So, a little bit of history, and I think it's an important thing, as Chris Anderson just wrote in his latest book, which is why I think there needed to be some pictures associated with it, he wrote the message that I think all of us should know is that it took the British 200 years to come through their industrial revolution from the time of the steam spinning jenny. It took America 50 years to come through the industrial revolution. It's taken China 10 years to come through the industrial revolution. And here's the punchline, individuals can take it back in one year. But there's an important lesson to learn from this and how it happens. This is how we used to learn. We used to learn in an atelier. As an individual, you would be an apprentice to someone who was a master. And on your pittoresque journey to learn how to make, say in this case, a violin, somebody would stand next to you and teach you how to do it. Today, such making looks like this. It's funny because you still have somebody teaching you how to do things. So I often ask people, what is the difference between yesterday's violin making and today? Or cars, for that matter. And I think I know that there's some people out there that already know the answer to this. Vern, for example, here knows the answer. There are many other people, friends of mine in here that I know. And that is that we used to share information like this. But today, we can share information like this. Now, when it was on paper, you could really only share it with the master who was next to you and anybody else who was willing to read what you had written down in your illegible handwriting. But today, somebody from across the world can understand how to make it. And that is the fundamental difference between today's making and learning and yesterday's making and learning. So you can make amazing things where you stand upon the shoulders of giants and you make things that never were possible before. Well, how does this apply to cars? Here's a parable of one of my favorite innovators. He was my grandfather. Ralph Rogers bought the Indian Motorcycle Company in 1943, and he spent all of his money on three innovations, and all three of them failed. If he had only been able to share the ideas that he was thinking about investing money in before he invested the money in it, then he might have learned how not to make those mistakes before he spent all that precious resource of capital on making it happen. So the lesson there says, Linus's law might be true. With enough eyeballs, all bugs, all software bugs is what he meant, are shallow. And Bill Joy's corollary to that, which came out inadvertently in an interview, in an interview where he said, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. I think both of these statements are true, but I've always wanted to add a corollary to them, and that is the Rogers blinding flash of the obvious. When the bugs get expensive, it gets harder to find the smart eyeballs. So, 
Here's one way to get the smart eyeballs to pay attention is you stretch your reach. Today, Local Motors is in 120 countries with community members across diverse disciplines helping to design vehicles. And they're all focused on the challenge that you have if you make your challenge famous enough. And vehicles are a mighty vertical. There's something that everybody has an experience with. Raise your hand if you've never driven in a car. The silence is deafening. Vehicles are the fabric that tie our world together, whether it's public, private, air, land, or sea. And having a world of solution providers together focused on your challenge, we believe can make those things come to market. So here's our community, physical and virtual. And here are they working on cars that they themselves have had a part in building. And this is our humble microfactory from which we started, where people come in and they take part in the real creation of a vehicle that has gone into production. We did a rally fighter. We're doing the first pizza delivery vehicle dedicated to Domino's. We did a military vehicle in four months for the US military. I got to hand it to the president myself, and he said, it looks pretty spiffy. <laughs> we do it faster, we do it with less cost, and we do it all because we have more brain power. Now, it's not easy, and there are things that need to be respected when you do that. But this is the data. We think we can do it five times faster. We think we can do it with 100 times less capital. And we think that we can recruit community members for about $5. If they can provide you with $2,000 of cost reduction, wouldn't that be worth it? Or $2,000 of increased price? It's an amazing trade-off. So my four caveats or my four lessons that I would give is give them leadership, give them organization, give them respect, and pay them with engagement. I'll talk more about this offline, but I want you to know that co-creation and crowdsourcing is not for everyone. And this little chart is something that I come back to all the time. So I hope that when you think about applying this perhaps to your business or your area, think about whether it's right for you or not. And this matrix, which is how many people know how to make what you do and how many people know how to use what you do, is a way of knowing whether you should be applying co-creation in your marketplace. Those people that find themselves in the upper right corner with a lot of people that know how to do what you do and know how to use what you do find themselves in a ripe area for co-creation. So think about that as you think about it for yourself. And I encourage you all to chase your dreams and make it happen. This was one of the first tests of one of our second generation vehicles out on the road driving behind a $350 million program, the C5 Corvette, and it cost us $3.25 million to put that car into production that's driving behind it on the highway. That was a moment for me and the 500 people in our community that created that vehicle. So thank you, and I look forward to sharing our story over the next two days. Please welcome VP of Product and Innovation for Project Frog, One Ash shot. Notani. One opportunity. Sees everything you ever wanted. One moment. Did you capture it? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to talk now about one of the largest industries in the economy, um, construction. And uh, what our perspective is on it, Project Frog, which is a company in this business that has a new take on how buildings should come about. Um, so any discussion about the future should start by talking about trends and long-term trends. So let's do that. In New York right now, you have under construction one World Trade Center, which is going to be you know, the tallest building in New York, eclipsing the Empire State Building. But what's shocking about that is we're now in the 21st century. We're 80 years after the Empire State Building was built. And the new building is taking longer with much more effort for a building that is effectively comparable. Um, that's not a good state of affairs. That's not the trend you want to continue. If that's the future, we're all fucked. <laughs> the, um, so, so what it means is but this doesn't happen in other industries. Other industries don't seem to suffer from this. Um, so let's go and look at some other industries and see what we can learn. Um, aerospace is a great industry to look at. A plane has many of the same features as a building. It has to be waterproof. Um, you need seats in it. You need uh, lighting, electricity, air conditioning, all those kinds of things. Yet a 737 can be assembled in as little as 11 days. And it comes to the factory full of like thousands of parts, all precision manufactured. 
and it goes together very effectively time after time, and it rolls off the production line, and it can fly. It's not like a building where then someone has to come in and fix it for six months. Um, the reason is there's repetition involved. They figured out the, the plane, and they do it again and again. Let's look at another industry. Let's look at the iPhone. Look how intricately that phone has been designed, all the little parts that go in. Everything's been planned. A building is not like that. Nothing is ever figured out in the building until the worker puts the piece in place. There's a bunch of drawings that communicate intent. But it, this, is, this is part of the problem of the industry. So when you look at this and you look at the economics, a shocking amount of the cost of a building is actually in the overhead. All the people that exist to manage, all the risk that's involved, because so much can go wrong because it's unique, it's never been done before, and that's what happens. And the labor is also very inefficient because, again, the guys who come to the construction site to put the building together, they don't know what they're going to face. So there's almost 70% of cost here that we've got to agree is very inefficient, and that's the opportunity. So what's the solution to that? Well, this is what Project Frog does. We, we call it component buildings. And it's about a set of very highly precision manufactured parts that come to site and get assembled right there that allows you flexibility in the configurations, and it works out of the box first time. So what does it look like? This is the kind of building we produce. This is one of the school buildings we have. We also do, uh, education. we do educational buildings, we do healthcare buildings, we do retail buildings. We're focused on the commercial sector. But what we're trying to show is that we can produce very high quality uh, buildings with the same lifespan as traditional construction in this method, and we think it's revolutionary. So a little bit of proof as well on the metrics. Um, it wasn't like this to begin with. I'm not going to claim the first time we built a building, it, it worked flawlessly. Um, but this is something that's been evolving. And we're now at the point for that for a 4,000 square foot school, we can, we can get that built in a month and a half. And we're also now at the point that we're cheaper than traditional construction. So if you have something that's faster and cheaper, that's a, that's a pretty good advantage. Not only that, but these buildings are super green. Um, these charts show how buildings respond to their environment. So this building is modeled in Santa Ana, California. And the chart at the top, top shows that due to weather, occupants, lighting, all those kinds of things, that building is warm most of the time, and it needs to be air conditioned. When you take one of our buildings that's been designed in this much more integrated manner, much more thoughtfully, you find that the building is actually uh, a lot more efficient, and most of the air conditioning needs have been removed. And beyond that, we're actually now taking it to what we call semi-passive, which is an area where we can actually take the air conditioning out of the building and save a lot of that cost at the same time, as well as the fact that it's greener. So how is this even possible? How do we do this magic? Well, go back to, go back to Boeing, go back to repetition. So it starts from having this toolkit of parts that we can build these different buildings out of. And each of these parts is very, very uh, precisely designed and, and detailed, so that we know exactly what, how it's going to work and how it's going to go together with these other things. Um, the buildings are, uh, the components of these buildings are very precisely manufactured off-site, and we use CNC machining, we use digital fabrication technologies. They come flat-packed on trucks, and then they get put in place very much uh, you know, assembled by a crane. But what we add to this is the fact that this is like lean manufacturing. We have a guy on site who's tracking every single aspect of that construction, timing it to the minute and second so that we can go and optimize it and figure it out and make it go faster and faster each time. Um, the other things we do is we don't leave this to chance. We're not going to let a construction worker just come and figure out how to put this building together. We provide an IKEA-like set of drawings where everything is very detailed, very precisely, so that nothing can really go wrong. But also part of this is rethinking design, and this is where the sort of the product, uh, product design mentality really comes in. Rather than you know, taking what's given, the way the industry's designed these buildings and just taking it as a given, we we'll rethink it. These components are going to come to site. They need to fit together. They need to work. And so it's an opportunity to do things in a better way. In this example, we've taken a ceiling, which is you know, 11 components that took four different trays to put together. And it's now four components. And it's faster. It's cheaper. And it's also given you a better quality of space because you have a higher ceiling. The, to do this, we also need a very rigorous and rapid prototyping philosophy, which means prototyping a small scale. Uh, places like Tech Shop, and we're going to hear from Mark soon, we've got our light fixture there being prototyped. And we also do very large scale prototypes, actual sections of whole buildings there that we prototype in our warehouse just to make sure that all these details and connections are going to work. So go back to trends um, if we want to predict the future. So we love looking at other industries, and automotive is a great example. The Toyota Corolla has been around since 1966, and it's now on its 11th version. And we would say that we humbly are probably on our third version. And so we're just getting going. And if you look at where Toyota was in 74 and where it is now, there's a lot of opportunity, and, and that's what we're excited by. 
So, but there are further implications of this. You know, today the industry is very focused on renovation. That's partly due to the economic climate, um, but it's also, there's also a feeling that it's better to make use of assets that already exist. But if you can build a component building faster and it costs you less than renovation, then, then renovation is really going to decline. And not only that, but new buildings are actually greener because a new building is so much more energy efficient, and energy efficiency is the biggest impact on its carbon over 50 years. That in our calculations, you'll actually get carbon payback if you knock down your old building and build a new building in six years. Beyond that, these kinds of buildings can be a real force of change in the world, and they can really enable people to succeed. In Africa, buildings don't get built because of corruption, because money gets allocated for a new school and it disappears. Um, we, because be, by providing components, um, these components can come to site. They don't go walking around like money just disappears. And additionally, they get built so fast that there's just less time for things to go wrong. In a place like Christchurch, New Zealand, where the earthquakes from a few years ago mean that it's going to take 14 years to rebuild that city with the domestic workforce, component buildings can help this city get back on its feet much faster because they're quicker and more efficient. So that's a little glimpse on what we think the future is in, in making buildings. Um, and sort of advice to you in your industries is to think about innovation as a journey. We have innovated, and it's been a journey, and it's been hard. And there are different, different things you have to do. There are wrong turns you make. Um, we're probably on our third iteration of strategy at this point, and I would say we're probably not done yet. Um, but the other thing we learned is we started with a cool product, and we thought, oh, we've got a cool product. This is great. But, but success is actually a lot more than just having a cool product. So you have to be nimble. You have to react to feedback, and you have to be fast. And that's my suggestions to you all. Thank you. Please welcome digital creaturologist from Creature Technology, Dominic DiGiorgio. Hi, everyone. Who likes robots? Yep. Who likes dinosaurs? All right, who likes robotic dinosaurs? OK. Creature Technology Company formed in 2005. Back then, they were most well known for their Walking with Dinosaurs arena show for which they had to design and build 20 uh, bespoke life-size animatronic dinosaurs. Now, I joined the company in 2009, and one of the things that amazed me was these dinosaurs, these amazing creations of technology, were built devoid of any digital design processes whatsoever. Engineering drawings were hand-sketched, dimensions were approximated, and even parts in the workshop floor were built and redesigned and rebuilt until they worked. Now, even though, regardless of this primitive design process, the creatures went on to form a unique set of assets um, that were the basis of one of the top grossing arena shows of all time. This so far performed in over 1,800 shows in over 200 countries around the world, constantly being packed and unpacked and needing to perform day in and day out reliably. So with a design process that has a really proven track record, why would we ever want to mess with it? Well, basically, the process was very inefficient. In 2009, DreamWorks approached us to create the creatures for the How to Train Your Dragon arena show. We'd be required to create 24 animated animatronic dragons um, that interacted and performed on stage with actors. They'd be ground-based and flying. They'd be up to 25 feet tall, and they'd weigh in the tons. And this was quite a complex project for us. So we decided to man up. We decided to get with the 90s, and we decided to introduce some digital design techniques to help us get through this project. And what we really wanted to do was get, some, get the ability to refine our designs to a much higher level within the compressed timeline of the project. Now, developing the creatures virtually, it pretty much opened up a whole new world for us. It opened up the door to rapid, rapid prototyping and CNC technologies that we just never had access to in the past. But most importantly, it forced us to think about our designs in a lot more detail than we were ever used to before. And as a result, it meant less wasted time on the workshop floor. But more importantly, because we could iterate through our designs much more quickly, we could actually start to innovate. And innovation is what drives us creatively and keeps us ahead of our competition. Now, over time, electronics get smaller, faster, and 
smarter, but the laws of physics stay the same. That's a problem for us because we basically make big, heavy machines. And at the end of the day, the bigger and heavier a machine is, the more complicated and more costly it is to make move and to control. So we're on a never-ending quest to save weight wherever possible. And we make regular use of common day materials these days, Kevlar, Aramid, carbon fiber, but sometimes we need to come up with unique solutions. We need to put some development in, such as this styrofoam bead muscle bag system, or even inflatable structures. Whatever we need to do to develop, to, to give our creatures the most believable look, the most unique feel, with the lightest weight possible. 3D printing, what an amazing technology. I don't know where we'd, we'd be today without it. I love my 3D printer. It sits right, right next to me. Now, a few years ago, we used an SLA technology to print durable versions of our maquettes. Now, today, for the cost of one of these prints, anyone can buy one of these desktop printers. Now, we use these for both prototyping parts and also fabricating components for our production. As you can see, this is a handle we use for one of our puppeteer control rigs. Now, in the past, we would have never considered designing a, a part like this. Um, we would have just bought something off the shelf that kind of did what, we did what we needed it to do. Today, we can design something that's exactly what we need it to be in an extremely cost-effective way. Now, building the creatures is only half the fun. We have to actually make them move. Now, creatures are generally controlled by a number of puppeteers, one of which using one of these rigs here. We call it a voodoo rig. Um, and the voodoo rig is great for creating intuitive uh, movements within the character. But it's not very well suited for repetitive actions like walks or runs or flying. For that, we have to look at a different technology. So we looked at the world of 3D animation. We took our CAD data, which we had this time, we took our digital scans, and we created a virtual control system, just as you would in a, animating a character for a feature film, animated film. We were then able to keyframe the movements we needed. We then created an interface between the 3D software we use and the character's control system, and before long, we had a virtually controlled two-ton animatronic dragon. Now, we're here at the... Um, thank you. <laughs> We're here at the future of making things, right? So what is, what's one of the things that we're looking at in the future? Well, let's take this piece of technology. I'm sure you've seen it, Xbox Connect. It's an amazing, complex piece of technology, and it's extremely affordable. Now, let's say we take the face tracking capabilities of this, and we give the puppeteer the power to use the face, a part of their body that they've never really had access to creating performances with. And let's say we get he or she to control something like this. But wait, let's not stop there. Let's take a little step further. Let's take the Kinect skeletal tracking system. Now, let's empower the puppeteer to use their whole body and drive something like this. Now, how cool would that be? Now, just in summing up, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. When you're looking for new technology, you, you have to keep an open mind. Generally, technology that, you're, um, that you might find may not be a perfect solution to what you're looking for. You may need to do a little bit of development. You may need to rethink it a little bit, but potentially it can head you in the right direction. And secondly, for everyone out there, whether you're an employee, an employer, student, or a hobbyist, just keep in mind one thing. The best investment for the future is people. It's you guys. Technology, as advanced as it may be, can't innovate, it can't create. It's just a tool. Only people can innovate. Thank you very much. All right, we're about halfway through. Uh, are you excited? I'm seeing not very many illuminated faces from screens, which makes me very happy. So thank you for uh, working with me on that one. We saw the themes of fast, open, and connected through our first three presenters. We saw it with Jay and how he's leveraging co-creation to bring really fantastic, innovative new products to market. 
We heard from Ash and how he's taking seemingly disparate strategies that one would use in manufacturing and my personal favorite, lean manufacturing, and transferring those over to the building market. That's amazing. Uh, and lastly, Dominic's slides I could watch for days, uh, but he's doing some fascinating things in leveraging technology to really open the role of the puppeteer and make these incredible experiences to delight uh, the, the folks that are lucky enough to experience uh, his designs. So uh, what I'm really hoping you're doing while you're seeing these presentations and when you see the next three presentations is thinking about how you can take these concepts and bring them back to improve your business, even something that could completely disrupt your market. So keep that in mind, and before you leave today, uh, you know, you're obviously the best and the brightest in your companies or you wouldn't be here. Why don't you send a little note to a senior executive and say, hey, I learned this thing at Autodesk University. I think it's applicable to our business. Let's talk about it on Monday. Can we do that? Okay, great. So without further ado, I'm really excited uh, to introduce you to Jason and Patrick. They're from Carbon Audio. And Carbon Audio is gonna, they're gonna talk about many things, but fast will be the thing I think you'll be most impressed with in their company. They weren't even a company a year ago, and a few months ago I was looking through New York Magazine and saw their absolutely beautiful product. So they can tell the story much better than I can, and let's welcome them to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm uh, Jason Martin, and this um, is Patrick, Patrick Triato. And we're from Carbon Audio. We're a Portland-based uh, audio company. Um, and like you said, you know, we weren't a company last year. So we're going to talk about a few things about being loud and fast. So this is our product. It's called Zuka, and it's a really simple thing. You know, we found a problem with the iPad that it's just not great for playing your music, or it's not loud enough, right? It's not good for sharing, and so we came up with this idea of this really simple silicon speaker bar, and literally from concept to on shelf at Apple Global in seven months. So, right, really, really quick. So, <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to talk about is louder. -er. You know, there's loud, and then there's louder. -er. We are louder. -er. We are louder. -er. Um, so, you, know, you know this. Yeah. Go ahead. Everybody knows this icon. It's, uh, it's on your phone, it's on your laptop, it's on your iPad. Um, and it's set to a certain parameter that everybody is forced to abide by. It's not loud enough. We need to be louder. -er. So, you know, this is it. It's all about color and fashion and accessories. And, you know, it's made of silicone. It feels good. It's soft. Mm. It has, like, an emotional connection to a very, you know, complex Bluetooth, you know, electronic product. So we're going to show you a little video here, kind of the development, the team behind the scenes that uh, helped develop the product. Here it is. Whatever your content is, if you listen to that on a device that can't play very loud, it's like listening to a very one-dimensional version of the experience that was created. Inside out design, outside in design, it's got to be a whole package. When we developed Zuka, we started with the concept for the architecture itself as being a grip and being as mobile as a tablet itself could be. Zuka doesn't look like a typical speaker because it's not a typical speaker. If you look on it from you know, a dead-on view, it's kind of like an egg shape. You can take it anywhere with you. It doesn't have to attach to anything. It's simply meant to function wherever you can bring your media. There was this logical place to put the drivers at the end of the tube. It allows this sort of full bandwidth sound. No matter where you are in a room, immediately you'll notice that it's different than a typical plastic product. We're using medical grade silicone. It's tactile, it's rugged, yet it's soft. This material is pretty fantastic. Zuka allows you to pair using Bluetooth to any of your devices. You have a 30-foot range, so you could be walking around using whatever device you're connected to and have Zuka wherever is most convenient in the room. If you don't have a Bluetooth device, it also has this 3.5 jack right here that you can plug into. This is a mic, so you can answer phone calls, eyesight slash home button group for your field of view of your camera. Pull out kickstand, which is nice for when you want to dock your iPad. We have custom designed 30 millimeter drivers. Even though they're small, they're incredibly powerful. It has Class D amplifiers, which give us high power to drive the drivers to the maximum. It also has digital signal processing, and it's one of the things that helps us get the extended low frequencies down to about 150 hertz, up to 20 kilohertz, and five times more sound than a typical tablet. 
that what we're trying to do with Zuka is give you a more three-dimensional experience, a wide sound field, as much of the bandwidth and loudness as possible so that you can experience the movies or music or any content as it was sort of intended to be experienced. Great. Yeah, so that's... Thank you. You know, <clears throat> that shows the team behind there. We've got, you know, great mechanical engineers and acoustic engineers to develop right. this, what looks like a simple product, but it's actually really complex. So it's a louder kickstand, you know. It's, uh, you know, like the video said, you know, it can go, it's not just for your tablet, it's for your phone, it's for your laptop. Um, you can use it on Skype. You can, you know, conference call with it. And the whole idea was to make it as versatile as possible with all the, you know, the great Apple products that are out there. Right, so mm. it's really simple. So now, kind of what we're here is about the future and technology. It's about being fast and faster. -er. And so let's give you kind of a brief overview of what we did over last year. So like we yeah. said, last year. We did not exist. This did not exist. Yeah. We didn't have sketches, we didn't have, you know, we basically started brainstorming, um, you know, about this time last year. Yeah. So this is kind of a timeline of the last crazy year we've had, so. Um, September 2011, we got together and decided that we were going to start an audio company. <laughs> um, you know, November, we started sketching. Mm. December, we had a uh, appearance model and some renderings. And then we went to CES and met with Apple and literally showed them, like, a quickly tooled silicone sleeve and they kind of gave us, this is cool. You know, it works. Yeah. All right, keep going. Um, in February, we started development, um, like Jason said, with Apple. So, you know, getting feedback, going back to them, and then, um, then we launched our Kickstarter campaign. So February to August 17th, from literally concept to shelf, global Apple, packaging, yeah. distribution, supply chain, everything, like seven months, like a crazy, you know, we've got a great team. We've got people from ex-Nike people, Logitech, mm -hmm. Intel, et cetera, that have all experts in their field. And, this is like one of the fastest products we've ever seen come to market and get in all these channels right. um, throughout the world, essentially. And I think that's that's pretty much the key point right there is the back end of everything. Yeah, like you know, you can you can design a product and make it in a week for sure, but to get it into all those stores in seven months from concept sketch to, yeah. to shelf. Yeah, hats off to the operations yeah. team. <laughs> um, you know, so how? You know, so again, we started this with Kickstarter. And we had a pretty successful campaign. And this got us basically our bridge funding until we got our first round of investment from our investment partner. And you know, right. gave us confidence that, hey, we have something here people believe in. It's cool. So that's the good part of Kickstarter. The challenging part, <laughs> Patrick handled all this. So well, I guess I'm getting coal for Christmas this year. Because uh, yeah, just be forewarned you know, with Kickstarter, it, it's a great tool. Um, whether it be just for marketing or you know PR purposes, it's a great tool. But you really have to be forewarned that there is, you know, negative consequences that come with it, and you really have to be responsible about it. And yeah, it's about communication with your consumers yeah. throughout the process. And even though you deliver the product on time or mostly on time, if they don't check a box or whatever, you're going to get some weird emails. Yeah. <laughs> so be forewarned. All so right. yeah, it's all about this expert team. This is the formula here. Um, environment and space, as you saw in our video, it's about open communication um, and creating this culture. And really it's about this united, unified vision that we all have as Carbon, about moving fast and being able to make decisions quickly, right. and move on. It all starts with design from the, you know, it, design is the, for, we're a design company. And it all starts with design, ends with design, and the operations development team trusts us in making really cool products. And right. that's the key with, uh, from this. So again, another uh, louder uh, video here yeah. to end. Um, and this is uh, Ben Carbon. Zuka, it makes everything five times louder. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got a little promo code. If you type go to our website and you type in Autodesk Zuka, the promo code, you get 10% off and free shipping for Christmas. Makes a great gift. So yeah. a louder thank you.
Thank you. Please welcome CEO of Maya Design, Mickey McManus. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. So we recently released our first report from our personal journey into, into the next computer revolution and the next, really, um, information revolution. Um, as you guys were walking in, if you were early birds, you might have actually gotten a free copy of it, thanks to Autodesk. Uh, how many people got a, a copy of Trillions as they walked in? All right. So um, we sort of think of this, and, and thank you to Autodesk for that. Um, we, we think of this as a sort of field guide to the, in, to, to the era of pervasive computing. Um, and, and I thought what I would do in my six or seven minutes is give you a little bit of a walk through the story. The story begins at the top of this current mountain. Uh, it's, it's a mountain we might want to call PC Peak. We are just about to hit four to six billion cell phones. You know, we should be kind of proud of this, right? This is a lot of computing. These things are practically supercomputers in your pocket. And we've made it to the top of this mountain. It's pretty exciting. We can talk to people on the other side of the world by swiping a finger across a piece of glass. 140 characters can topple a government. <clears throat> but a strange thing happened. We got to the top of this mountain, and as many times happens, you get to the top of the mountain and you find out there's actually a much bigger mountain waiting over the rise. And that is Trillions Mountain, a trillion computing devices. And it's coming in less than five years. And, and, and basically, it's a done deal. This is happening whether you like it or not. If you thought a few billion cell phones were a big deal, this is much bigger. If you just talk about processors, in 2010, we manufactured more than 10 billion processors. And that number has gotten larger every year. We now make more transistors than grains of rice, and we make them cheaper. This is a done deal. This is happening whether we like it or not. In fact, this isn't even the interesting part of the story. A trillion processors, a trillion computing devices, that's like a super saturated vapor. The interesting part of the story is what happens next. Today, when you think about computing, you look into a computer. You see desk, desktop with folders and a trash can, or you look on your phone and you see uh, applications. The information is in the computer, but the seed of change, the thing that's going to change all those computing devices is connectivity. Connectivity will hit that super saturated vapor and it's going to flip the switch. Think about Intel's Rose Point, Radio Free Intel. It's an initiative to basically get radios to join Moore's Law and that inexorable exponential explosion that's happening in Moore's Law by building them entirely out of silicon. So think about this for a second. As connectivity seeds all these computing devices, we will shift from information in the computer to you, me, our products, our neighborhoods, our communities, the world being in the information. It's really like turning the sock inside out. This is going to be ultimately a massive opportunity for unbounded power and complexity. Now, I mentioned complexity. Complexity and power are often interchangeable. The danger isn't actually complexity itself. The danger is malignant complexity. It's not a trillion one-dollar bills. It's not like the national deficit. You add up a bunch of trillions, you suddenly have some kind of problems. This is a trillion things sending out a billion messages. This is a trillion things getting a virus. This is a trillion things turning into a brick because you did a bad update. <clears throat> and I don't even want to talk about the shift from how long you can, you know, how much time you can spend using things to how much time you now spend waiting for updates, waiting for things to get fixed. I'm hoping that the future is not forcing us all to become computer literate, but shifting to asking the world to become a little bit more human literate. So there are dangers, but let's not talk about that. We put them all in chapter three. If you guys are interested, drink a little hemlock, have a little fun, read chapter three, 
um, say goodbye to the world. But we don't think it's all dark. Mai has been working in our labs for over 20 years. And what we've been lo looking at really is focusing on the rise of trillions. And we've got a few things to report. And we kind of thought of the book and our report as a first draft, sort of a map of the territory that we think is lying ahead. One of the first things we discovered is nature can teach us something. You know, if you've got to do something really hard, go find somebody else who's already done it. You are a complex information system in your own right. You're going to go 80, 90 years at a stretch without any catastrophic failure. Every single person in this audience has between 10 and 100 trillion cells. And each one of them has enough storage to, to basically equal 200 New York City telephone books in them to make you you. So nature laughs when it sees the cute little experiment called the internet, because it does better than that every day. We might want to think of this as biomimicry for information systems. In the book, we talk about Pando. This is Pando. It's actually a quaking aspen in Utah that's been around for 75,000 years. This is the internet of plants. If you go about an inch below the surface, you actually find a mycorrhizal network. It's a social network of plants based on something in symbiosis called mutualism where they're moving carbon back and forth between dying plants to living plants, water from areas of abundance to drought, connectivity and information, conferring resistance against disease. Nature's been here. And if you think about all these things, you can kind of think about it as almost beautiful complexity. This is the way nature's design patterns have evolved. We get things like mutualism, but we also get things like redundancy, modularity, hierarchy. One of the patterns I think is particularly interesting is something called generativity. This is actually interesting because it's a pattern of, of, of not form, but process. Generativity is actually the way we got the original Macintosh Apple. And it's actually a pattern that you can use to explore your business and to, to really take advantage of trillions. While nature's been there, you know, so has man. Uh, humankind has been at work pretty busy. Um, you know, it's sort of looking at design, architecture, engineering, finding patterns focused on the interaction between people and the built world. Today, we can kind of build anything. You, you heard about it this morning. We can build anything, and we can make it right. The new question in the new era is, what's the right thing to make? And that ultimately turns out to be a question of human-centered design. One of the things we did is we looked over 120 years worth of creativity and innovation techniques, and we came up with ways that, that really apply to this challenge ahead. Methods for looking and listening, methods for understanding, analyzing, synthesizing concepts, methods for envisioning future possibilities in a dynamic, nonlinear world. And the secret is to gain agility by involving your users. You know, Joy's Law, there are a lot of more smart people outside of your company than inside, to uncover unvoiced and unmet needs. It's a big journey. There's a lot of stuff going on, almost limitless business opportunities. And that's a good thing, because if you look at the current mountain, we're at the very top, and the economic value is dwindling fast. We're fighting over the last few inches. MySpace has to die for Facebook to win. But if you look at the surface area on trillions, it's big. It's really big. We predict the rise of something called T-commerce, trillions commerce. We're charging fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a penny. Anything multiplied by a trillion, by the way, is a big number. And harnessing the exhaust data from today's disconnected products and services to mint new billion-dollar industries overnight. We think there are business opportunities in connected devices. We think there are business opportunities as you flow between different kinds of places. We think there are opportunities as we start to bring not only connectivity to space, but also to time. And we think ultimately this is going to lead to sort of an information carbon cycle, sort of close the loop, an ecology, where your exhaust data powers the turbines of t-commerce. You know, in, in a real ecology, if you don't move fast enough, you become food for something else. Nothing is wasted. If you think social was a big deal today, think about what happens when disposable products, when in whole environments become social and join the social network, when raw materials join the social network. Last point, there's going to be a bubble. Just like the bubble you know, before the big, the big uh, the dot-com bubble before PC Peak, there is going to be a mother of all bubbles coming up, the internet of things, the, the pervasive computing bubble. And we wrote this book to help one of the two kinds of people who actually make it through a bubble. So the two kinds of people make it through Vegas as well, with more money in their pocket than you know, when they came in. We can't help one of them. We can't help the lucky ones. You know, they hit the jackpot, great. 
You know, I won't say the word Instagram right now. But we can help the smart ones, right? The card counters who learn the underlying patterns. They can future-proof their offerings by learning how to play and win the game. Ultimately, we think it is a big journey. We think there is a lot to do, and we are hoping you will join us because we would love to see the top of the next summit. Thank you very much. Please welcome CEO of Tech Shop, Mark Hatch. I think they want me to do this. All right. Yes, let's join the revolution. So my name is uh, Mark Hatch. I'm the CEO, co-founder of uh, Tech Shop. Uh, how many people here know what Tech Shop is? Raise your hand. Awesome. We're getting like much better. First time I did that, nobody raised their hands. I'm, I'm going to give you a quick slideshow for those of you who haven't uh, seen it. Besides uh, being the co-founder of Tech Shop, though, I am also a uh, former Green Beret. I, by definition, then am a professional revolutionary. Um, as a professional revolutionary, um, one of my jobs is to recruit and radicalize fellow members of a revolution. You are seeing a revolution in front of your eyes, and what I'm hoping to do at the end of this is to encourage you to radicalize by taking an affirmative action of some kind and join the revolution. And with that, let's get started. So TechShop, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, membership-based fabrication studio, and we have a lot of equipment. That's the kind of the cool stuff. So we have uh, machine tools, woodworking tools, plastic tools, electronics tools, we have an automobile bay. We have this really wicked thing called a water jet. Which if you can get a four by eight sheet of six inches thick of titanium up on it, it will cut through it like butter. Uh, we have uh, welders. We have laser jets. I've been going too fast. We have literally every tool you need to make just about anything on the planet. We also have, if I can keep going, uh, food. So we have uh, popcorn and coffee. It's free. Uh, it turns out if you're a startup, um, it's one of the things that comes in really, really handy. I think we've had at least a dozen startups subsist on buckets of popcorn and coffee. Most importantly, um, the tools aggregate a community of the most creative people in every city. I believe it is the most creative place on the planet. On any given Friday or Saturday night, you can bump into Nike engineers, Apple engineers, artists, students, architects, rocket scientists. And they're all hanging out working on their own projects, occasionally their company's projects. We have six locations in the US and we're growing. We have 4,000 members, about 800 in uh, San Francisco. We're a membership-based do-it-yourself fabrication studio. So besides being able to go through the Industrial Revolution personally in a year, I actually, we tend to put people through that in about three months. So you can become fluent of the tools of the Industrial Revolution and have access to them inside of three months for $100 a month. So for a $300 investment, you can join the Industrial Revolution personally. So why is that important? Well, there are 40 million creatives in the United States. There are hundreds of millions of them around the world. And since about 1750, they have not had access to the tools of production and creation. Now they do. For the cost of a Starbucks addiction, $3 a day, you have access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution. This has the opportunity to change the world. Actually, it already has, and I'll talk about that at the end. What's driving this is these tools are cheap, easy, and powerful. Thanks to uh, the software that Autodesk um, is producing, we routinely teach people how to use a mill in three hours. You add a three-hour class in CAD, and you can be producing products this week. That is truly remarkable. That is absolutely a revolution. So here are some things that people have made, right? So here's a, uh, the world's fastest electric motorcycle. Did 218 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats. Uh, this is Mike Pineo. You are looking at a, the world's first desktop diamond manufacturing device. 
When the staff came to me and said, hey, you got to go meet this guy, I went over and said, hey, Mike, what are you making? And he said, well, this is a desktop diamond manufacturing device. And I giggled um, because it ripped a new neural thread in my brain. And when that happens, I tend to giggle. It's like, so, Mike, how does it work? He said, oh, it's easy. Yeah, right. First, I pump 95% hydrogen one port. I pump a bunch of methane in the other port. I put in a piece of graphite. I fire this baby up with a used magnetron from a microwave, and bang, <laughs> yeah, exactly, bang, diamonds fall out. It turns out he had about 40 years of experience before he attempted that, but what was new was instead of spending $100,000 like he had had it bid a few years earlier, he spent $1,000, learned how to do the mill, and this is the very first milling project he ever did in his life. What's great about this one is that David, and you should see him today at about 3 o'clock, this time last year had never made anything in his life. He now owns an open ROV underwater robotics company. Boom. Welcome to the revolution. This is Patrick Buckley. So if you go through your personal industrial revolution in three months, you just saw somebody using Kickstarter launch their company in seven months. So in like 10 months, you can have a company. Well, unless you're an overachiever like Patrick, and you create a million dollar company inside of three months, from the time he walked in and asked, what classes do I need to take to learn how to make an iPad case to a million dollars in sales, it was 90 days. It's changed the world. This is Square. They're worth $2 billion. They've created tens of thousands of jobs across the U.S. This is the uh, most efficient uh, data cooling center. It's going to save hundreds of thousands of tons of carbon around the world. Emerson Electronics licensed it. This is a, 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 a system that figures out how much fertilizer is in the ground. These guys went from uh, idea through four generations of prototypes to $2 million in their Series A in 14 weeks. Got to keep going here. This is the world's cheapest drip irrigation system, and this is a blanket that's on track to save 100,000 babies' lives in the next five years. So using what you've just heard from this amazing panel, what will your company make? Really, things have completely changed. I used to do new product development. It took me ages to get something out. It doesn't need to anymore. This was produced at Local Motors using that open innovation process. Zero to completed project four months. This is an automobile done in four months. DARPA cares about intellectual property, so don't throw me the intellectual property argument. This is their next project. This is an open source amphibious fighting vehicle. So don't tell me it can't be done inside of your organizations. The U.S. government is doing it, and they're looking to do this entire platform for about one one-hundredth to one one-thousandth of what it used to cost, and they're going to do it in two or three years instead of a decade or more. So what are you going to make? That's my question, and here's my uh, challenge. All it takes is one small act to join the revolution. So what I'd like you to do is this Christmas make one present for a family member or a friend, and you will start to join the revolution. Thank you very much. All right, I'd like to uh, welcome now everybody up on the stage. And now that they've seen each other's stories and we've had a chance to interact a little bit, I thought it would be good to do just a couple questions with them because I really want, again, for you guys to have something actionable that you can take back home with you and have that conversation with the senior executive on Monday. We got some stools here, okay. Please, let's not be polite. <laughs> All right. So the first thing I was really curious about is, you know, guys, now that you've seen one another's stories, what has come to mind that you didn't get to tell us in the spiel that you just did on stage? Does anybody want to start? Jay? It costs a lot of money to do it. And so if you can hear me, the bottom line is that, uh, um, 
you have to think of non-traditional ways to get out there and fund your business. And uh, it doesn't come from venture capital. Uh, there are so many better ways. Kickstarter has come up on screen, but there are so many other ways to fund your product. And if you can figure that out, then you can be successful. Does anybody else, else know some other ways? Well, speaking of which, a quick plug for uh, the JOBS Act. Uh, the SEC um, is in the middle of the rules making process. And uh, this is the biggest opportunity for startups since about, oh, I don't know, 1933, when they started making it illegal to advertise. So this is going to be a huge opportunity. Talk to your congressman. We need to get that thing done like right now. Jumpstart our businesses act jobs. Look into it. Yeah, yeah I think, I think uh, one thing that's been really, you know, that uh, I've, I've seen really works really, really well is, is that, uh, you know, just, just talk to people. Education talk to everybody. To Meet people and, you and really, really just, you'll be amazed if you go up and talk to someone who they know, introduction here, introduction there, mm -hmm. and it's sometimes as simple as that. You show mm -hmm. them your idea and they're like, hey, I know something that can get you backing for this. Yeah. And sometimes it's as simple as just talking to someone, yeah. sharing. I want to add one. Um, so what I didn't say, I, I mean, I said that we need to focus on making the right thing, but I didn't say, I'm a little worried that we're going to have a crisis of creativity in the future. I don't know that we're investing in our children and in the next generation in the right things. If you're five years old and you can't draw a bunny rabbit, we sort of beat creativity out of you. We tell you to go be an accountant and then when you're like 35, you go back and you go to get a, uh, you know, an MBA and you go to the D school or you go to Harvard and they start to teach you design thinking again. And I don't understand why we're not teaching design as a basic literacy at the age of five. Because the future is about creativity and agility, and I don't think that we're taking this seriously. Yeah. Nice. I mean, on that note, I think we all look for young talent to come in and, you know, get us moving and excited. And I think some of the, the younger candidates I meet with have that spark, and other ones just don't. And I'm wondering if any of you can comment on that and, and talk about, you know, what you look for and what you've seen that's either impressed you favorably or, or not so much. Well, so uh, um, I'll give my two cents. Maybe some other people have some yeah. things. Um, I think I got lucky. My, my mom was a scientist. My dad was a, a car mechanic. And so I basically built everything when I was a kid. Um, but I lived in an inner city school, and I found kids who were, you know, the, my, my best friend was the biggest drug dealer in school. You know, the, there were other kids that were getting shot in the streets. There were, you know, police officers with guns at every, at every entrance of my high school. And, and so you can say that that environment is going to, you know, quelch that creativity. You can say that some people are creative and some people are not. I got lucky. I just don't think luck is a plan. Mm. I, it turns out making is a gateway drug. What he said about build something for, for the holidays is huge. Yeah. And I learned it really easy, and I got a taste of it. And so I don't believe, I think it is not that there are some people that are creative and some people are not. You can build creativity in your brain. If you look at a jazz musician's brain, it is shaped differently, the people who actually know how to do things. Their fact checker actually is more active and they have semi-conscious control because they've practiced. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things is we don't expect enough. We don't set the bar. Skylar was um, unbelievable this morning. Yeah. Felix, crazy, right? Yeah. But there, you know, we have a hell of a lot more of them out there and they're mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I just don't think we expect enough. Mm -hmm. I, th I think two, two of the questions. I think two of the questions that um, always um, have to be asked are, why is something done this way, yeah. and how can it be improved? So um, just th those two questions on analyzing something you see out there, don't take anything for granted. You, you buy a device, um, don't be forced into having to settle for, for it working that way. It's, it's up to you to think about these things. Start to you know, come up with ideas in your It'll mind, possibly out. come up with something even better. Possibly not, but it's that thought process that really kicks, kicks creativity off. Yeah. Ash, yeah. can you riff on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, to build on that, I'm OK with Mike. Um, I think one of the things that is critical, we talked about talent and all that kind of stuff, but it's a diversity. And people talk about diversity a lot, and it's, you know, it sort of gets overplayed. But it really is true. You need people from different backgrounds and different places to make this stuff happen, because you're trying to solve something. You've got someone else to solve something in another realm that can be applicable. So um, I think that's something most companies today are just made up of the same kind of people again. Again, you hire people that look like you. Go hire someone that doesn't look like you. Go hire someone that shocked you in the interview. Yeah. That's actually where you're going to get some creativity. I, I want to add one last bit. Oh, um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that hiring people who are not like you, one of the best things you can do, one of the reasons why we practice open innovation, at least asking questions and getting people engaged, is we generally don't hire anybody that isn't in our community, ever. 
it's the most important thing that you can do. We started out using it as sort of a guideline, but today, if somebody's not in our community, why would we hire them? Because yeah. we know that they haven't engaged in the thought process. So I think finding people who don't look like you, you can develop a process for doing that. So last point, I mean, you said, does everybody, you know, is everybody creative, right? And I, I think it's fair that some people are born with some native talent a little bit more than others. Um, but, you know, 100 years ago, we agreed math, science, math, reading, writing, arithmetic were going to be basic literacies. We, we teach at five. That doesn't mean we got rid of the need for mathematicians. That doesn't mean w that we got rid of the need for specialists who are crazy amazing. But it meant that everybody can balance their checkbook. You know, a, a little bit of literacy around design, a little bit of literacy around these things in a world that you can make anything might be really helpful. And, and I think uh, the last little point on this is that this diversity thing, um, True story, submarine gets lost in the, by the U.S. military back in the 1960s. The guy responsible for finding the submarine goes to an oceanographer, a sea captain, a submariner, and a weatherman. He gives them a map and a pin and asks, you know, here's all the data. Where do you think the sub is? We lost this. It's kind of dangerous. <laughs> he did not let them talk to each other. He allowed to have diversity. He used a process called late averaging, which is an important sort of fundamental pattern. And when he collected them all together, they averaged the results using a Bayesian algorithm, and they found the sub 32 meters away from the average. So everyone had a piece of the answer. And if you put it together the right way, you end up getting it. And so it's really important. It's not just the, the madness of the crowds. It's understanding how to get to the wisdom of the crowds and this diversity. Yeah. All the interesting problems are at the intersections of these disciplines. They're not at the, at the centers. Yeah, and I think, you know, sometimes it's wonderful to do crowdsourcing, but sometimes you come up with a more conservative design uh, instead of maybe if one individual comes up with it themselves. Jay, I know that's counter to what you're doing in your business, but do you have any thoughts on that? If I had a that? nickel every time somebody said you're going to build the Homer mobile, I would be <laughs> such a rich man. So the point is that there is a huge difference between averaging out a design and between looking for people that are fantastic. So I might take issue with, uh, with what Mickey said because the bottom line is we don't look for an average of designs. When we're looking for a solution, we're looking for something that is a bolt out of the blue for a common problem. And so we try to identify the, the problem really clearly, and then we look for the best solution so that we don't average the design, but we actually find something that's deeply interesting and polarizing. All right, I just got to say one thing to that, though. I agree with you. I, it's the difference between early averaging and late averaging that I would posit. Early averaging, the loud mouth wins. The shrinking violet shrinks. You get mediocrity, not black or not white. You get gray. Late averaging, you get some really interesting things. Mm -hmm. and, and I think your, your organization, your community is actually doing that. You're finding the amazing people but you're pulling them out in the right process such that you, you let them shine and you amplify them. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And I like the way we're kind of giving this idea of crowdsourcing real talk in a way. And I really like the way you guys from Carbon Audio, we're showing the risks. We're saying, oh yeah, we did this Kickstarter and we got funded, but there was an ugly side to it too. And I know we've laid out these strategies for the audience both in the room and at home, but um, are there other risks that we should be transparent with these folks about? <laughs> Well, yeah, so um, <laughs> okay. bad Tell news. Me how you good, really good news and bad news. Uh, there's a pretty reasonable chance you're working for a dinosaur um, and they're going extinct, so get ready. Uh, you need to retool, rethink, and uh, seriously think about relaunching your career uh, when that event happens because there's, a, again, I'd go 50 50 chance that you're working for a dinosaur now. Um, and they're embedded in the old world and how to launch products and how things are going to happen. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a Skylar out there that's going to come out and disrupt this, your industry in amazing ways uh, because the tools are cheap, easy, and really powerful. So before you all quit your jobs and go work down at Mark's tech shop and you know, fuel his <laughs> growing empire, um, I think one thing's important to talk about innovation, which is innovation takes a lot of ideas, but the other thing that makes innovation work is a rigorous filtering down of those ideas. Like, if everyone went and go start doing all this stuff, like, you would get some great creativity, but people would be, you know, you can spend too much resources doing that kind of stuff. So there's a whole, there's a whole risk here that you don't necessarily know you're onto the right thing, and so you have to be pretty, pretty surgical about this isn't working, get out of it quickly. So mm -hmm. if everyone is going to go and innovate, they just need to be very disciplined about it. Mm -hmm. I also want to, I, I want to make sure, you know, Mark, I have some really good friends who are dinosaurs, and they're, they're, actually, <laughs> they're actually really nice guys, so, you know, I, it really was a generalization on your part there. Just want to make that clear. <laughs> Any other thoughts on sort of the ugly side of this rosy picture we, we've painted? Well, I, I just want to touch on your risk uh, comment, you know, just, uh, just be prepared to work your ass off. Yeah. Like, you have to be all in, like... Yeah. 
hundred percent, hundred ten percent. I love being an entrepreneur. I get to pick which hundred hours of the week I work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you can't. I can't overstate how hard it is. Harder -er it is. Um, <laughs> no, it really is, and, and you just, yeah, I think you have to kind of change your mindset when you take on risk like this, like, I don't even think about money anymore. I just think about, like, tomorrow, my next goal, this problem, the solution, how can we make this faster, increase margins, make the product better, what's our next innovation? You know, you kind of have to have this, especially where we are right now in these early stages, you know, it's all about the product, the problem, the solution, make sure the team's holistic and together, moving as one, that unified vision. Um, that's the most important thing. Everything else will work itself out, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I think I, on the last tip of little your comment tongue. on this was is just I, I think um, this harder thing uh, in in trillions. Well, one of the things we discovered, and I think we talked about it. Carl talked about it this morning. The the ability to simulate things. So simulate your business, not only your technology, but your business. Simulate a year and a week of your business. Simulate both of them together. In in the future, you can't design from the top down. Ecologies don't work that way. You need to basically plant seeds, harvest, grow, find those wildflowers. And so wicked problem solving, by definition, you don't know the answer until you start solving it. And so what happens is you simulate it, and then you stimulate it. You basically poke the nest, and you see what happens. And then you simulate again, and you stimulate. And you go back and forth, sim and stim, so that you learn as you go. And you, you reveal the problem that it is. Otherwise, you are generating a lot of heat and no light, and you will just waste your time. And I think this is, this is exactly the point. You're getting out there. You're trying these things. That's, that's such an important uh, part of this. Well, we just have a few minutes left. So what I'd like to do is maybe just run through and very quickly, guys, maybe uh, you know, just a couple sentences. What practical advice do you want to give these folks to take home? What's the one thing you wanted them to learn today? If somebody tells you what you're thinking about is a good idea, then you can pretty much bet that somebody else has already done it. But if they tell you it's a bad idea, then that's when the wheels should start turning. Because it either is a great idea that no one's discovered, or it's a bad idea and you should run the other way. Sage advice. The, um, you know, we talk about making things, but actually one of the smartest people in our company, he actually goes about breaking things. Hmm. And actually, I think that's very cool, which is go take something apart. Go like, you know, go get vicious with it. And um, see what you learn, because you'll get some ideas out of that. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for technologies, look hard. And you don't even have to look hard these days. There's so many places, um, so many communities that um, share their information, like Instructables, uh, Make, so many places that you can go in and get people who just in their everyday life come up and have ingenious solutions to things. Because, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to take technology and demystify it and make it affordable for everyone else. So look hard. You, you'll definitely find something that is at least in the lines of what you're trying to do, and then work with that technology. Uh, I would say get out of your comfort zone. You know, just uh, try something brand new that you are not comfortable with, and own the results, and try it again. Yeah, and kind of to second that, it's it's really about you know constantly trying to reinvent yourself or your next business or what you were before, right? And, and what the next opportunity is whether it's you're doing audio and should be doing audio, should be doing something else. What's the next, what's the next thing beyond you know, sharing music on an iPad? That's the way we start thinking about things to create the next new category, to define a new category to make your next innovation. So kind of reinvention is really important to us. So um, if, if you are a company with a product or a service or an environment or you, you're building something, make a list of 10 other companies, products, services, environments that you would never think about partnering with. And then think about what would happen if you were connected to them. So I'll give you an example. A uh, uh, garage door maker installs garage doors in 40 million homes in the world. They own that real estate. They can harvest that real estate for 10 years. They know what's happening in the garage. What happens if they put a camera sensor at the top of that garage door and it's paying attention to the color of the paint and the fading of the paint on the car that gets parked there every day? Suddenly, they are possibly generating information that might be hugely valuable to PPG, who, who makes paint for cars. Right? So, so strange bedfellows. And think about what happens when we, when we really mean this. Your waste data because some, becomes someone else's food, and someone else values that. Connectivity is much bigger than what we think of today. It's not just the internet. The internet's arteries. We're talking about capillaries and veins and deep, digging very deep into the world. That's what's coming. So make a list, strange bedfellows. 
So uh, radicalization theory, and this is in all seriousness, says that you've got to take somebody out of their current environment, move them into a new environment where they create new experiences, new competencies, new memories, um, and gel as a team. Um, I highly recommend for you personally, as well as your boss and your team, to come to Tech Shop and experience what you've heard here uh, directly. We have these amazing events, um, welding and wine, lasers and beer, water jet and whiskey. I'm telling you, power tools and alcohol is a phenomenal event. Um, you got a great opportunity for... <laughs> no, no, there is an order there that is pretty important. Uh, it is a great opportunity to uh, create a tangible experience for understanding a lot of these trends. Excellent. Well, I think that was excellent and sage advice. So I hope within this forum we've entertained you, we've provoked you, and hopefully inspired you a little. And I really do want you to write a note to your senior executive before you leave and, and have that meeting on Monday and put some of these tactics to practice. Uh, I would love to thank, first off, Mike Roy, who's been our silent but awesome graphic illustrator. Hi. I'd like to thank Heather McKenzie, who has tirelessly put this together. I'd like to thank Mike Geyer, who has been the momentum and the creative spark behind this panel. And of course, I would like to thank the wonderful experts we were lucky enough to learn from today. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us. Have a good Autodesk University.